Okay, welcome to the Apple Podcast. This is Lex. This is episode 78, and this is coming out on July 1st, 2011. So let's talk about Apple stuff. And again, this is a commercial-free chit-chat, free podcast. So let's get to it. Okay, so uh, one of the big stories that continued this week was the controversy over Final Cut Pro 10, or as some people call it, Final Cut Pro X. And um, this new update to the Final Cut Pro, you know, which is the the professional version of movie editing on on Macintoshes, was very controversial. It came out last week. And it was huge controversy, and there's a huge, it's almost like a civil war. There's a civil war going on. A lot of professional uh, editors who use Final Cut Pro are furious, furious that Final Cut Pro, you know, uh, has been changed so radically and that it's missing some stuff. And, um, you know, I'm in the camp, I like the, the new version of Final Cut Pro. And I wrote a blog post which really explains also why I think Apple came out with this radically different version of Final Cut Pro. And, uh, well, let me just, I'll, I'll tell you what I said in the blog post. Um, Final Cut Express is, is actually why Apple made Final Cut Pro more like iMovie. Uh, one reason that Apple made Final Cut Pro 10 more like iMovie on steroids than the heir to Final Cut Pro 7 is probably the following, the Final Cut Express problem. As many of you know, back when iMovie 8, which came out in 2008, Apple had iMovie take a radical path. Apple created a completely new way to edit movies with iMovie by chucking the traditional linear editing UI interface. Up until then, iMovie had a linear editing UI that was somewhat related to the UI in Final Cut Pro and Final Cut Express. Now, if you remember, the old iMovie allowed you to have your iMovie project imported into Final Cut Pro. That is how related those products were. Once Apple made a radical change to iMovie, it faced a problem. iMovie became even more radically different than Final Cut Pro and Final Cut Express. It was already hard for the budding movie maker to graduate from iMovie to Final Cut Pro or Final Cut Express, but when Apple redesigned iMovie with iMovie 08, the gulf between the styles and UI interfaces of iMovie on one hand and Final Cut Pros and Final Cut Express on the other hand became even greater. Now while iMovie 08 and iMovie 09 became even easier to use, that caused it to be even harder for an iMovie user to graduate up to Final Cut Express or Final Cut Pro. The editing language of iMovie 08 and iMovie 09 were way too different than the editing language of Final Cut Pro and Final Cut Express. So Apple was faced with a real problem in deciding how to upgrade Final Cut Pro and Final Cut Express. If Apple upgraded Final Cut Express to continue to be in the style and editing language of traditional Final Cut Pro, then fewer and fewer new movie editors weaned on iMovie, iMovie 08 and iMovie 09, would bother to upgrade to Final Cut Express or Final Cut Pro. And have no doubt about it that the population of users of iMovie is vastly larger than the population of Final Cut Pro and Final Cut Express users. Apple is a business, and as a large business, its primary concern is to sell hardware and software. It made total sense for Apple to make the next version of Final Cut Express build on the new language of editing that iMovie 08 and iMovie 09 pioneered. But once Apple committed itself to making Final Cut Express be based on the editing language of iMovie, what was the point of having a version of Final Cut Pro that is totally different than Final Cut Express? None. So Final Cut Pro had historically been not that different than Final Cut Express. The former essentially had more tracks and other tweaks here and there. It made no sense for Apple to have two different families of video editors, one with an old language of editing for high-end professionals and a new language of editing for novices, iMovie, and prosumers. 
Final Cut Express. In the end, Apple realized it made no sense to waste resources on two different paths for editing languages and instead decided to unify under one modern method. Apple also did everyone a favor by reducing the versions of the new video editing products to just two, the free iMovie version and the $300 Final Cut Pro 10. This also made sense as the difference between Final Cut Pro 7 and Final Cut Express was not that great while the price difference was enormous. Now Apple can dramatically expand the population of Final Cut Pro users as both the price point of $300 and the ease of ease of use make it a compelling upgrade for anyone who has used iMovie. I am one such user who has made the upgrade to Final Cut Pro 10. Now, you know, the controversy continued with regarding Final Cut Pro and Apple apparently offered some rebates to people who purchased Final Cut Pro and were upset. Apple also on its website issued some some clarification as to what Final Cut Pro the new one can and cannot do and um, it was similar to what David Pogue offered last week in an article explaining there were workarounds within Final Cut Pro. But um, but you know there was you know the back and forth articles continued and there was there's one article that I kind of I kind of like agreed with which is from Business Insider by David Dudas of Sorensen Media and the article which came out on June 30th is entitled The Hysterical Rants of Final Cut Pro Users and this is what he said I'll I'll jump around what he said I'll I'll uh, I'll read it he says as the entire world knows by now Apple recently released a major update to their professional video editing software Final Cut Pro the update was so radical in nature that Apple increased the software version number from 7 to 10 with the 10 de- denoted denoted by the Roman X shortly after Final Cut Pro 10 was released a vocal group of Final Cut Pro seven users went bonkers with indignation the offense that triggered their outrage the new version did not include several popular features from the old version clearly this group of consumers expects major software releases from large software companies to contain all features from previous versions plus presumably several compelling new features unfortunately such a product development strategy inevitably leads to complex bloated software that only meets the needs of the high end of the market to the exclusion of the other larger customer segments as clay christensen points out pointed out nearly 10 years ago bloated software like this from an incumbent technology company is a prime target and i mean prime as in turkey shoot or fish in a barrel that kind of thing for disruptive young companies looking to knock the king from the top of the hill he goes on to say and that's actually a very good insight about bloated technologies because i did find and this is me paraphrasing now to myself that final cut pro 7 was really way too complex in terms of you know going into the the deep parts of the um, program for control and um, anyway let me continue with what what this uh, david dudas said he says It's no secret that video editing software is too complicated for Joe Average. Whether it's Final Cut Pro or Avid Media Composer or Adobe Premiere, everyone knows these products are for the pros and the rest of us are forced to either learn how to use them or not or use the crappy consumer grade products. Thus the market is overripe for disruptive innovation. He goes on to say, over the past six years, I've observed several startups come and go trying to disrupt the video editing software market. The first was a company I started in 2005 called iSpot, which was followed over the years by Jump Cut, Motion Box, J Cut, Pixorial, Mix Move, Stroom, and pro- probably several others I've overlooked. The writing is on the wall. If you believe Christensen's thesis, Apple has been setting itself up for eventual failure by perpetuating the Final Cut Pro line with sustaining technology improvements while barbarians are aggressively storming the gates. So what did Apple do? They disrupted themselves by doing exactly what any disruptive innovator worth his salt would do. They released a disruptive innovation, Final Cut Pro 10, with lower performance and price than the incumbent Final Cut Pro 7, improving the product in radical ways that the market would never expect. He goes on to say, existing Final Cut Pro users 
for their part, launched it into indignant tirades of entitlement. Apple owes them. Apple has sold them out. Apple has abused their trust. Apple murders kit- kittens, etc. It left me wondering, where, where does this sense of entitlement come from? Why does Apple owe Final Cut Pro users anything? If sometime in the past you paid Apple $1,000 and in turn Apple gave you a f- copy of Final Cut Pro, the commercial transaction has been completed. Apple owes you nothing. I'm even more perplexed, he goes on to say, because Apple is generally speaking the inventor of awesomeness. If Apple wants to reinvent something, I say by all means go ahead. I'm old enough to remember that MP3 players existed and sucked. Sorry, Diamond Rio, long before the iPod was unveiled. And I also remember so-called smartphones, which also sucked long before the iPhone graced this good earth. Nevertheless, Final Cut Pro users should not despair. If Apple continues to play the Christensen playbook, and they most certainly will, the next step after Final Cut Pro 10 has gained a foothold in the market is to begin iteratively adding advanced features until the new product eventually appeals to the high end of the market. He goes on to say, how do we know Apple will continue to follow this playbook? because they're loyally following it play by play and because Apple has played the disruptor role in the past with great success, most recently with the iPhone. Remember the righteous indignation from armchair quarterbacks everywhere, everywhere when the iPhone launched without obviously necessary features like a video camera, gasp, MMS, horrors, cut and paste, shocking, and so on. Yet here we are a few few years later, and all of those advanced features and more are safe and warm in our pockets. So buckle down, Final Cut Pro 7 users, and bide your time with the software version that you love so dearly. After all, you still have Final Cut Pro 7. It's not like the Apple it's not like Apple took it away from you. You'll just have to wait a few years until all the professional features are restored to the product line. Then you'll be ready to upgrade to Final Cut Pro 14. So I got to tell you this. First of all, this David Dudas person, who um, is the vice president of video solutions at Sorensen Media, he writes really well. I mean, this was very well written and entertaining, and I think he makes incredibly valid points here. Because, you know, look, I'm someone who yeah, I'm not a professional video editor, but I'm very adept at using software. I've been using Mac-based software for I don't know you know since the beginning right and i really really over the years has made every effort to try to use and regularly use final cut pro or final cut express uh, in movie editing and i just i found found it too difficult it, i always had a simpler version of iMovie to fall back on and i would rather use sort of hacks and tricks within iMovie to do my editing and what I like about the new Final Cut Pro uh, 10 is just that it has this sort of ease of use with iMovie, but it's like filled with advanced features. So, you know, I, I hope this um, criticism of Final Cut Pro 10 dies down because uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's accurate. Now, now, you know, one of my observations about Final Cut Pro is, you know, Apple could be just very clever here because the people who are complaining the most, they talk about how in broadcast video and they talk about, you know, uh, the, these, these, the, these features that are really needed uh, for sort of professional grade television cameras and movie cameras. Uh, but what they're talking about is production in big television and production in big movies. But maybe Apple sees the horizon and sees that really the future is disruptive television making and disruptive video making. Because, you know, right now we're seeing an explosion of video content on the Internet. And Google itself is sponsoring, you know, uh, YouTube video producers to go to school and take some lessons on making better video production. And so maybe what Apple envisions is that there's going to be an army of, of amateurs who are now going to become quasi-professional professional, and they need an upgrade path from iMovie to a more advanced but not impossible to use 
video editor. And maybe that's why they said, yeah, it's great. We could, you know, have the old version of Final Cut Pro that supports maybe 5,000 high professionals in Hollywood and on Madison Avenue. But maybe what Apple's thinking is, you know what, there could be an army of a million movie editors out there in the world who want to do advanced stuff, who are the future, and they're preparing content for the web, not for sort of traditional advertising or television or traditional television or movies. And maybe, you know, Apple says, you know what, the future is really, you know, this sort of easier to use but packed with features, new language. And I, I call it a new language because Final Cut Pro 10 and iMovie have a new language for UI and for editing of movies, you know, and, and, and it's also more touch based. It's much more conducive to using like a touchpad. So anyways, uh, I agree with David Dudas. I think that's a very insightful article. Okay, so for uh, I guess several weeks, if not months, I've been running the Lion Beta on an external hard drive with my 27 inch iMac. And I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm really loving Lion and I'm loving the Beta and it's very stable. And um, I can't wait to have my regular hard drive, which is in my iMac upgrade to Lion because I think Lion is really, I don't know, I just kind of love it. And and here's the thing, it's running really faster than um, my my uh, Snow Leopard on my iMac and, and it's running from an external hard drive so I'm not sure why exactly it's running so zippy. But anyways, Lion may be upon us, it might, might be upon everybody, Cult of Mac has a report on June 30th that says that Lion will launch on Mac App Store next Wednesday. So I guess, guess that's the 6th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And the article says, we know the release of Lion is imminent, not just because Apple said it was coming in July, but because supplies of MacBook Airs and MacBooks are dangerously constrained, yet Apple is holding back new models. So when's line dropping? And he and um, Cult of Mac says the latest rumor says right after this holiday weekend, and we're inclined to believe it. And I guess the source is a podcast called Three Guys in a Podcast, uh, and they say one particular item of interest about this news is that with Lion being an online release only, Apple, Apple can wait until the 11th hour to release new OS. They don't have to first lock it down, then press it onto DVDs, then box it. Um, so anyway, so they seem to think it's going to come on July 6th. And I think that does make sense. Uh, I don't think Apple needs to wait that longer for Line to come out. And I think everybody should upgrade because I think it's going to be, it's going to be re really a great operating system. At least the beta is. Um, but here's the thing. You really, if you have a, uh, a desktop computer, um, an iMac or a Mac Pro, you really do need to get the Magic Trackpad. I've, I've, since it came out, I guess last year, I've heavily embraced the Magic Trackpad, and I think it's, um, you know, I think it's an incredible, incredible addition, and better than the mouse. Um, you know, you can just do amazing things with the uh, Trackpad, and what's nice is built into the um, built into the system preferences if you go to trackpad you get little tutorials on how the um how the uh, the different um the different um you know gestures work so if you um you know if you want to see the g gestures oh, oh i guess in lion you can't see the gestures uh let's see no nope, it doesn't do it automatically but anyways, uh, I guess when the final version of Lion, they'll show you, they'll have the little videos that show you how to use the, um, the Magic Trackpad. Okay, on uh, July 1st, today there's a big deadline between Apple and Amazon, I guess, and other uh, app developers that um, are facing the deadline to conform with Apple's new subscription policy for the app app store and as some of you may know apple backpedaled 
uh, from what they originally proposed, which is Apple originally stunned a lot of app developers uh, by saying that if you were going to offer a subscription in app, you had to offer an, a subscription in app that was at the same price or less than what you offered to people to sign up outside the app, let, let's say on a website. And you know that really upset people because if you if you if people subscribed in app apple takes 30 percent of the cut and a lot of people said that this was crazy you know because let's take um you know magazine or book sellers you know they have a small margin so if apple takes 30 percent it you know they're not going to make any money so then apple backpedaled recently and said no you can you don't have to. Uh, you can have an app that has subscriptions, and you don't have to have the subscriptions offered in the app. You can have it be outside the app on the web, and you're not required uh, to to match that with a subscription in it. But you can't have a link in your app that takes you outside to the web. So it's kind of a compromise. So then, let's say for a company that sells eBooks they could, or a subscription service for, let's say, a newspaper, the newspaper app could have you sign up outside the app on a website and not offer any subscription in the app, but still get the subscription, but not have any links that take you outside the app. Now, a number of companies have conformed, and the deadline is July 1st, and a number of companies like Hulu, the Hulu Plus app, has conformed by by getting rid of any link outside the app but the big question is the Kindle will Apple you know as has Apple as of today booted the Kindle from uh, the Kindle app from the App Store because the Kindle app um, basically if you want to buy a book in the Kindle app it takes you to Amazon's website through a link and so will Amazon revise it or will Apple no longer offer the Kindle app in the, in the store? And Mac Rumors has a nice article on June 30th pointing that out. It's entitled, Will Kindle App Survive Apple's Deadline for iOS Content Purchasing? So I think, I think, um, I think Amazon's going to conform because it has too many users on uh, iOS devices. So I think they're going to conform and I think people will just go to a web, a website, uh, and, and not a, um, not by link in the app. I bet you Amazon just puts a little sign that says, hey, we can't, if you want to like buy a book, you have to go to the browser and go to the Amazon store. So interesting times. Okay, so this week, Apple finally started selling a Thunderbolt cable. Now why is this big news? Because in the spring Apple for the first time revealed a new technology for an interface for Macintoshes that have been that have been on any computers before then and it's a technology that Intel developed I guess with help from Apple called Lightspeed. Is it? Uh, yeah, Lightspeed. And anyways they called the um, they call the interface Thunderbolt and Thunderbolt is basically a quantum leap in the data connection that is going to replace Firewire, USB 2, USB 3.0, eSATA, you name it because uh, Thunderbolt connections can basically you know have something up like 10 gigabyte data back and forth uh, so it's um, 10 gigabytes per second, I guess, data back and forth, which is blazing fast and much more data than you could ever get over FireWire or um, or eSATA or even USB 3.0. So iMacs have come out with Thunderbolt in them. MacBook Pros have come out with Thunderbolt in them. And it's expected that the MacBook Airs and the Mini Macs and the... Um, and the Mac Pros will have Thunderbolt. And the other advantage of Thunderbolt is that you can also use it to connect to monitors. You can daisy chain them. And, um, you know, and they go two way data. So they're very, you know, they're very useful. So Apple finally started 
selling them and they go for a whopping fifty dollars and but the thing is there's a reason they go for so much money because they're not just a simple cable and the website i fix it got a hold of one and tore it down and basically there's all sorts of circuitry and in the um in the um cable they found two genom g9 gn2033 chips in the connector on one on each side and they were flanked by other much smaller chips, which they say surely added to the cable's cost. Two chips labeled S6A1JG on one side and chips labeled 1102FSS8370 and 1313S on the other. And um, so they go on to say that they, you know, that these these chips really add to the price and they they were probably necessary to help you know this massive data go quickly over over this cable because basically you're going to be able to just have blazing fast speeds between your external drives and your um your mac now one of the good things about thunderbolt is it looks like thunderbolt and this is according to macrumors.com Thunderbolt does support booting from an external disk. Now remember you can do that with FireWire, Firewire and I guess with USB too, but that's very important because if you have these blazing fast speeds by cable to a Mac with Thunderbolt, you can imagine a situation where you have like a MacBook Air that doesn't hold much data and then you bring it home and with one cable you connect it to a, an external monitor and um, you know your hard drive or whatever and let's say you have the operating system there you can just boot it externally and so Thunderbolt supports external booting from an external disk so you could you could have really um, a more powerful computer at home that you connect to um, your MacBook Air and boot it that way so now, one of the, th the things that's a little annoying is right now there's not a lot of things that you can connect by Thunderbolt. There's not a lot of products out yet, but it's expected that there will be a lot. And some of the stuff that's out now is very high-end stuff. For example, there's a 12 terabyte, uh, very expensive 12 terabyte uh, RAID hard drive from Pegasus. And I think uh that comes like i think it's like fifteen hundred dollars or so yeah here are the prices pegasus has one raid hard drive that's four terabytes with four four bays that's four bays at one terabyte and they're asking a thousand dollars for that and their high-end one is 12 terabytes that's six bays at two terabytes for two thousand dollars so this website, Anantech, tested uh, Apple's Thunderbolt cable with this Pegasus system, and they basically got really fast blazing speeds. So, um, you know, I think, um, you know, I think, um, I think people are going to be flocking to this. Uh, flocking to this new way of connecting. Okay, one of my um, one of my favorite stores, at my favorite Apple stores, which is actually the first Apple store in uh, New York City, the Soho uh, Apple store is going to be temporarily closed for renovations. This is reported by MacNN.com. The article says that Apple's Soho store should close sometime during the next three months to accommodate planned renovations. It cites a report and it says the company will be taking over ground floor space behind its current Soho property. The space was once operated by the U.S. Postal Service but was emptied in 2009 and it said that building permits show that the existing first floor of the Soho store will be undergoing changes of its own although the first ever glass staircase will remain and um, you know I'm, I'm a little bummed this this was really my favorite store 
because it was the first store. And if you've ever been to the Soho store in Manhattan, uh, it it has really a great little theater upstairs to take classes and lessons. There are these uh, three other big stores in Manhattan uh, on Fifth Avenue, uh, on the Upper West Side, on Broadway, and in uh, the Meatpacking District on West 14th Street. And really the Soho store, even though it's smaller, has a better little, you know, learning area. Like they, they offer classes in the other stores, but the Soho store has this little amphitheater, and I hope they don't get rid of it. Uh, the other, the other thing is uh, the Apple, Apple's uh, iconic store on Fifth Avenue, is um, which has the big cu- glass cube. That's now been boarded up and it looks like they're going to be renovating that and who knows exactly what they're going to be putting there but should be interesting okay so this week this friday july 1st hewitt packard sell starts selling its rival to the ipad the touchpad and the reviews are already out and i put a, a post up with links to some of the most important reviews and the most important reviews are by Walt Mossberg of All Things Digital, David Pogue of the New York Times, Gizmodo, Josh Topolsky of uh, This Is My Next.com, Engadget, The Associated Press, and Bloomberg. And I, I mean, I quickly reviewed these reviews, and they all seem to be basically saying that the touchpad falls way short of the iPad. And it falls short because it's the same price, but it's heavier and thicker and it's buggier it doesn't have you know it's not it's not worked out as bugs and it doesn't have enough apps that in a nutshell seems to be the problem so if you if you have some money to spend let's say five hundred dollars or six hundred dollars why would you get uh a and also i guess it has like a plasticky feel so why would you get a device that feels heavier is thicker is clunkier and has is kind of buggy in its software and doesn't have a lot of apps to choose from so i think they're they're going to have a real uphill battle i'll talk about it more in my ipad podcast which comes out usually on sundays i'll try to get it out this fourth of july weekend on sunday the third but i might have to get it out on the fourth so anyways uh I can't recommend, based on the reviews I read, anybody buying the touchpad. Uh, I would stick with the iPad because until somebody comes through with something that's more compelling, there's really no need to get anything but the iPad if you're going to get a tablet. Okay, so one of the big things that happened this week was that Apple's somewhat rival Google made a big announcement and revealed a new social networking service called Google+. Plus. And, you know, I asked for an invitation right now. It's hard to get into Google+. Plus, But the reports are that, it, and Google has identified, that it has lots of interesting features. Uh, one feature is clearly a direct attack on Facebook uh, in which you can, you know, quickly create circles to share with uh, your friends uh, information. And so it's a way to have more targeted socialization through you know groups of friends that you could create called circles but it also has other cool things like the ability to um, to have huddles and uh, you know which would give you the ability to have sort of group video chat Uh, also it has something that you can you can photo stream and share photos Uh, now what's interesting is you know, where does Apple fit in this thing? Is Google's Plus a threat to Apple? It clearly is a threat to Facebook because it's a way to sort of network and share stuff with friends that would mean you wouldn't use Facebook. But the appleblog.com has an article by Daryl Etherington on June 29th in which he argues that Google Plus should help not hinder Apple's social efforts. And he basically says that it's going to just further the use of iOS devices and mobile devices by Apple, and that Apple should, should, um, you know, should, I don't know, not hinder Google. 
And here's some of the arguments that he makes. He says, Huddle is Google's mobile group chat service and probably stands the chance of being the most similar to what Apple's got an offer with its upcoming iMessage, but it's designed ar around a very different type of messaging. You can organize contacts in, in, into groups and automatically message across the groups with a simple tap and huddle, but it resides within Google Plus and it isn't integrated with your device's text messaging app. iMessage will serve as a communication tool for impromptu conversations with one or more people and all the functions people normally accomplish through text and MMS. Huddle looks like it will appeal more to work teams and other more formally organized groups and will work for the kind of event planning people do with groups of friends on Facebook right now. He then goes on to say, instant upload and photo stream actually have very little in common and make clear the different guiding principles behind Google's new product and Apple's offering. Instant upload, that's Google's service, is for sharing with a wide audience. Photo stream is for keeping your media organized on devices either you or your family, your close family owns. It's the same with FaceTime and Hangouts. Uh, Hangouts is the video chat conferencing thing from Google. He goes on to say, one is about one-on-one -on -one communication between relatively close contacts, while the other is about casting a wider net for a totally different kind of interaction. These could butt heads down the road if FaceTime implements group chat, but even so, FaceTime will likely be used in different contexts. So I, I kind of disagree with Daryl Etherton. Ether you know, he seems to think that what Google is doing is not a threat for Apple because the services are slightly different than what Apple's doing, that they're more geared to group sharing as opposed to one-on-one -on -one sharing. But clearly, Apple's technology, let's take FaceTime. Uh, FaceTime is a video chatting service, and obviously at some point, Apple is going to, you know, expand it beyond one-on-one -on -one chatting and allow group chatting like, like iChat. Apple doesn't jump the gun and go a whole hog into something. Apple likes to test it and see if video chatting, you know, on mobile devices, you know, can stand the bandwidth. You know, because right now FaceTime doesn't even work over 3G. So Apple's not, Apple's not going to push the technology, but that doesn't mean it's not competing with Google. If Google comes out with a video chat tool, um, it's it's clearly, uh, Huddle is clearly a threat not only to Skype with video chat, but any video chat service. And FaceTime is definitely a video chat service. So is, um, you know, so is um, a Apple's Huddle um, Huddle service. Um, so, and the same with the photo streaming. You know, Apple maybe doesn't, at the beginning, you're just streaming to your other devices, but Apple could easily expand its photo stream technology to allow you to share with other people. That's what we want. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know why Daryl Ether think, think doesn't think this is a threat to Apple. It is. Um, if anything, it's something that Google can bundle and make easier in Ando Android to sort of bring people over to Android phones at the expense of the iPhone. So I think he's 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 very wrong. I think this is going to be seen as a threat to Apple as well as a threat to Facebook and as well as a threat to uh, Skype. Okay, so this week we celebrated a big anniversary. On June 29th, it was the four-year anniversary of the debut, the actual sale, of the original iPhone. And uh, GigaOM has a nice article by Ryan Kim, which does an overview of what that means. And um, so let's take a look at their recap. Uh, basically, they point out that Apple's fortunes shifted dramatically because of the iPhone and the ensuing iOS devices. For example, on June 29, 2007, the day of the iPhone launch, uh, Apple was trading at $122 a share. And this Tuesday, it was trading at $335 a share with a market cap of $310 billion. He also points out that on June 29, 2007, Research in Motion was trading at $66 a share and 66 cents, 
and now it's trading at $28.24 with a market cap of only $14.7 billion. So imagine that um, RIM, well, RIM is, an, is worth less than 5% of what Apple is currently valued at. And Nokia stock in, on June 29, 2007 was trading at $23.63, and now it's trading at $6.11. And similarly, HTC, um, uh, HTC has gone from uh, 361 Taiwanese dollars in June 27, 2007 to... Uh, well, actually, it's it's uh, it's gone up to 1,040. So HTC, I guess, HTC has done uh, has done well. So, you know, it's basically it's become a huge part of the business. You know, Apple's revenues from iPhones, iPads, uh, and iDevices totally dominates. Uh, Apple's revenues. So, for example, in the first quarter of this year, iPhone revenues hit 12.3 billion and were 49.8 percent of Apple's revenues, uh, and the Mac was only 4.9 billion. So, it's been a you know th these last four years have been huge and they've really changed the world if you think about it. I mean, the iPhone really changed the iron grip that cell phone companies like Verizon and AT&T had on smartphones and any mobile phones. I mean, before the iPhone came up, you know, if you got a phone from Verizon or AT&T, you could not like easily get your your pictures off of the phone. I remember Verizon would charge me like 20 cents a, a, a photo to get my my photos off of like some LG phone I had. And I certainly couldn't, um, you know, put my own music on the phones. Or and if I wanted ringtones, I had to pay a lot of money to get the ringtones. And now with the iPhone, I can put my entire iTunes collection, and or I can't put all of it, but you know, I can put whatever songs I want on the i iPhone. I can make my own ringtones in GarageBand and stick them in the iPhone. And I don't have all these crappy, you know, carrier apps that are forced upon me in the iPhone. So Apple, Apple's iPhone really, you know, has changed. It's changed the cell phone industry and it's also changed the computer industry. And it's changed the computer industry because if you think about it, the iPhone and the iPad and the iPod Touch and the Android phones, they are the computers of the future because they're becoming more and more powerful uh, remember the first iPhone was that not that powerful it it really just ran a few limited apps uh, and didn't have an app store and it wasn't that powerful and you couldn't shoot video with it you just uh, shoot pictures and and look what we have now with the iPhone 4 I mean the iPhone 4 is very powerful I can shoot high definition video I can run all sorts of you know powerful apps. I can, I've got a great movie editing app in the iMovie app and the Real Director app, and for a lot of people in the future, it's going to be their main computer. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced as these, you know, smartphones get more and more powerful, they're going to replace regular computers. You know, I did a, I did a little experiment using the HDMI dock connector uh, at work I have a couple of monitors and I you know I iPhone now has pages app on the iPhone the word processor app and it also has the keynote app well I at work I hooked up my iPhone using the HDMI out connector to my second monitor you know like a 20 inch monitor and I and I connected my Bluetooth Apple keyboard to my iPhone and my iPhone essentially became a computer, right? I mean, I was able to now see the pages document up on a big screen and I was using a big keyboard to type on it. So imagine, imagine what's going to happen as the iPhone gets more and more powerful. 
and starts to rival desktop computers, right? Or becomes powerful enough. Don't you think that a lot of people are going to have something like a dock where they take, when they get home, they plug their iPhone into a dock and it powers the monitor and you have your keyboard there. And when, you, when you're on the go, you just take out your iPhone and you're on the go and, you know, that is your computer. And right now it might not be as powerful as, you know, my quad core i7 iMac, but progress points in the direction of iPhones and smartphones becoming more and more powerful and more and more replacing everyday computers. So June 29th, 2007 was a very important day. And, um, you know, I think it's great that GigaOM looked back uh, and thought about what the implications are about the iPhone. Okay, so, um, you know, we're due for a MacBook Air refresh. There are rumors that it's going to come in mid-July. But one question is, what's going to happen to the white plastic MacBook? And Apple Insider, no, actually, TUAW.com, uh, actually is reporting on what Apple Insider is reporting. And they're saying that white MacBooks are now in low supply. And uh, according to a post from Apple Insider, stocks of MacBooks are sold out at many authorized Apple resellers, including Amazon, Mac Connection, and J&R. And other resellers are reporting low inventories as well. And apparently they've discounted the MacBook Apple for education buyers which could account for the reduction of in availability. So, you know, one of the questions is, will Apple just end the plastic MacBook line? Uh, you know, maybe it'll replace it with a cheap MacBook Air, let's say at a price of $899. I personally think they should. I, I think if Apple, I mean, the, currently the cheapest MacBook Air is $999. And if Apple can get it down 100 bucks, uh, and have a lot of this iCloud service, uh, maybe they could convince education establishments to get the cheaper MacBook Air and not, you know, not lament not having the MacBook. The only advantage of the MacBook is that it had bigger storage because you could put a regular hard drive in the MacBook and have 250 gigabytes or 500 gigabytes of storage. But I think, I think Apple may discontinue the MacBook the white MacBook and just go with slick looking 13 inch, 11 inch, and maybe even 15 inch MacBook Airs. Clearly the future of Apple's laptops are something like the MacBook Air. They're selling like hotcakes and um, I think that's the way they're going to go. Now there had been much talk in the last year that you know that the iPhone is going to somehow go under because of an, an onslaught of Android devices, and people like Henry Blodgett was saying uh, that Apple was repeating mistakes from the 1980s where it had like a lead with the uh, its personal computer, but then let Windows and and Windows and Intel and um, you know. Um, IBM clones take over the PC industry and they were basically saying that Apple's going to do the same thing in the smartphone market. Well, it turns out, you know, that's a lot of, you know, that's a ridiculous analogy and I mean, I think why Android was doing well at the beginning was Apple only had the iPhone on AT&T in the United States and Google was giving away the Android operating system for free. But once Apple had a cheap version of the iPhone, and that's the 3GS that it sells for 50 bucks, and also once Apple started selling the iPhone on Verizon, you know, a lot of people think, thought that things would turn around. And sure enough, uh, businessinsider.com had, had a chart on the 30th, which uh, basically indicates that Android growth has stalled and that Apple is gaining steam with new smartphone buyers and basically the report comes from Nielsen 
and it basically says that Android still has the largest share of smartphone market, but thanks to the Verizon iPhone, its share of new phone buyers has flatlined, and that Apple's share has picked up, moving from 10% of new smartphone purchases to 17% of new smartphone purchases this year. And it goes on to, to show basically this chart that Silicon Alley Insider put together. And if you look at the chart, let's see, let's see if we can uh, expand it. But basically in the, um, oh, I clicked the wrong click. Uh, in the chart, um, what do we have here? The green is Android, and above that, the sort of gray is Apple's iPhone, and um, above that is RIM, Windows, and others. So, so it looks like Android's growth is sort of flattened, while Apple's in the last quarter has has gone up. In other words, of the new buyers, Android had 27% of new buyers last quarter, and this quarter it has 27%, while Apple has gone from 10% to 17%. So that's pretty significant turnaround. Now, there's been a lot of speculation by some analysts, including an analyst at Deutsche Bank called Chris Whitmore, that Apple is going to do something very interesting in the fall and not only come out with an iPhone 5 but come out with iPhones that have prepaid uh, services and are unlocked. Now what does that mean? And, and according to well GigaOM article uh, by Daryl Earthington and other articles I've read apparently in, in most of the world uh, outside the US the way people buy uh, cell phones or smartphones is they don't they don't have a you know a recurring service plan, but they rather prepay for the minutes. Uh, you can do that with the iPad 3G. You can either get a subscription service where you know the month goes by and your account is automatically charged, or you can prepay the month and if you run out of data or calls then you have to affirmatively go in and prepay again. So in most of the world outside of the United States and Canada, that's how people buy um, cell phones. And that's mainly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, where prepaid contracts make up the vast majority of all cellular service. You know, there's, one of the reasons for that could be people have a lot less money. And so when you get one of these subscription plans, like, you know, with AT&T here, you know, they do a credit check because you could run up a huge bill and you have to be on the hook for it. But when you prepay something, you don't have to worry about the credit check because you're only on the hook for what you paid for ahead of time. So apparently Apple, there's some talk that Apple's going to come out with a iPhone, maybe an iPhone 4S that would resemble the iPhone but would be sold unlocked for use with the prepaid service for $349. See, the real challenge for Apple is that unsubsidized, you know, when you buy when you buy an iPhone with AT&T, you're locked into a two-year two contract. So let's say the 32 gigabyte iPhone 4, you'd pay $300, but really AT&T is paying Apple like $750 or $800 for that iPhone and they're subsidizing the difference between the 300 you pay and what they pay uh, Apple. So Apple needs to get a decent amount of money. And so the question is, can Apple make an iPhone for which they're only paid $349? And that's kind of a challenge for Apple because Apple likes to have decent margins, 30% margins. So Apple has to get the components down. Uh, to be cheap enough so that Apple still makes a 40% return. But if Apple can pull this off, its growth potential in the rest of the world is enormous. Because right now, it's you know Apple still has a very small percentage of all cell phone users. But imagine if in the rest of the world, uh, people can get an affordable iPhone. They'll go for it because it will be not only their cell phone, but it'll be their computer. Think of what it's going to do to people in Africa, people in Asia who don't have a computer, 
but now can afford, let's say, a cheap iPhone. So if that happens, you're going to see tremendous growth in users, and that could translate into more app sales, more other content sales like music sales, movie sales. And, um, you know, I think that's the direction that Apple's going in. I think we're going to see that at some point. Okay, so whatever you're doing now, do not now buy a MacBook Air. And the reason you don't want to buy a MacBook Air now is because I'm almost absolutely certain that in the coming weeks in July, Apple will come out with a new MacBook Air. And the new MacBook Air is going to have really new compelling features. It's going to have uh, Sandy Bridge processors, which are the incredibly fast and powerful processors that you have in the MacBook Pros and the iMacs and it's also going to have the new Thunderbolt technology which is going to allow your MacBook Air to connect to external devices or monitors and have blazing fast connection and you want those those features and there's no need to get it now because really you're buying the old model now it's it's clearly at the end of its cycle all the signs point to a MacBook Air refresh so don't do it. Wait another week or two because the MacBook Air will come out and a good chance it could even be cheaper, maybe by 100 bucks. Now, I'm seriously thinking of getting a MacBook Air. And why would I get a MacBook Air? Well, I have an iPad 2, which I love, and I have an iMac, a 27-inch quad-core, which is very po powerful. But a MacBook Air would give me flexibility because the 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 iPad 2 uh, for is is you know while I can do content creation on the iPad 2 like I can edit movies and I can record audio there's some things that I can't do that I'd like to do for example I do all sorts of interesting editing to get my video podcast and my uh, movie podcast out I do conversions where, let's say, I create the movie version, screen recording. Uh, well, let's take screen recording. Right now, without jailbreaking your iPad 2, you can't do any screen recording on the iPad. And a lot of my movie podcast involves screen recording the, the stories and features that I see on my Mac. Now, you can screen record on an iPad too, but it involves jailbreaking. And right now, there's no good untethered jailbreaking for the iPad too. So that's one thing that I can't do on the iPad is screen recording. And I can't um, do sort of quick um, extraction of audio out of movie. And right now, it's not easy to move audio from one app to another app very easily. I think in the next version of iOS 5, Apple is going to enable the ability to uh, transfer, let's say, audio into GarageBand and out of GarageBand just, you know, let's say through email. But right now, let's say I record an app on iMovies um, and the iPad, I record, let's say, a podcast and uh, create like a movie version of the podcast and then I want to extract the audio just for the audio version of the podcast well I can't do it all just on the iPad now now I think eventually Apple will allow more advanced features like that on the iPad when the processor becomes even more powerful but right now I can't do that in a mobile environment I have to come back to my iMac so that's one reason I would like to do that okay Thanks for listening to episode 78 of the Apple Podcast. This is Lex at MaxFuture.com. Uh, and remember, you can reach me at MaxFuture at gmail.com. Or you could leave a voicemail at 617-826-9676. Thanks for listening. And see you next week. And uh, have a great Apple week. Take care.